Hello everyone, welcome to a session about how to create um, Vagrant development machines for MariaDB good practices. So who am I? Um, I'm Federico Razzoli. Mm, I'm a MySQL and MariaDB user since forever, an open source supporter. Uh, I love abandonware in all its forms, from retro computing to castles. And uh, I found that this um, database consulting company called Vetabase Ltd last year. Mm, we offer um, database consulting in all its aspects, but in particular, we focus on uh, automation. So if you don't know MariaDB knowledge base, I really suggest you take a look at it because it's great. And I can proudly say that Vetabase is contributing to it um, with a new section about automating MariaDB deployments and administration. And of course, you can find a section about um, uh, um, Vagrant. Before starting, um, I want to say that uh, all examples you will see in this presentation, you can also find in GitHub. Note down this URL, please. You will find a working example using both um, Shell and uh, um, Ansible for provisioning the machine. So enough blah, blah, blah. Let's talk about the good practices. Warning, I have opinions. So whenever a human being says good practices, it means good practices according to me. So um, let's start by some generic principles that uh, you should follow. First of all, development machines should be as similar as possible to production because we want to avoid the situation when someone um, commits something to production and it doesn't work and the person says, oh, but it works on my laptop. Actually, they are right if it works on their laptop, but this shouldn't happen. Um, but at the same time, of course, uh, development machines should cost much less, right? <laughs> because maybe in production we have uh, tens or t thousands uh, or <laughs> of servers and we cannot have the same number of servers uh, for development. Ideally, we can have only one. And uh, development machines shouldn't stay in the way, meaning that it's okay when you join a company to um, use some time to uh, set up the development machine and understand how Vagrant works. But during a normal workday, um, one shouldn't waste time to find out what's going wrong. So uh, more specific advice. Um, for development machines. Should we use virtual machines or container? Well, uh, most commonly I would say virtual machines, but it depends what you use in production. Uh, if you use containers in production, then you should use containers uh, as development machines. If you develop um, desktop applications that uh, should be distributed for several operating systems, you should have several virtual machines. Um, and another thing is uh, at the beginning, use only one machine. You may reach a point when this is not feasible anymore, and in that case, use more machines. But don't do it from the beginning, do it only when it is necessary. Of course, it can be difficult if you have microservices, but one thing that uh, many organizations can do is to connect uh, development machines to microservices in staging. Of course, those microservices should use anonymized databases. Uh, this is a requirement from GDPR and possibly other regulations. So some more uh, specific, um, specific recommendations about MariaDB. 
use the same MariaDB version in production and in staging and in development. Um, by same version, I mean if you run uh, 10 dot five dot something in production, you should run 10 dot five dot something in development. Uh, the last number doesn't necessarily have to be the same, except if you are a MySQL 8 user. In that case, I recommend to use exactly the same version because unfortunately MySQL adds uh, new features and relevant changes at every minor version. Um, also, the MariaDB variables that affect queries should be the same in production and in development. And also in development, you should have some extra tools and SQL views and settings that make easier to debug um, problems and uh, find performance problems before they reach production. So mm, this is a probably incomplete list of the variables that uh, affect queries and therefore should be identical. Most of them probably you don't touch, right? Um, but the most important is SQL mode because it determines sometimes if a query uh, succeeds or fails. And it's also very important to set the same character set and collection. Um, some extra settings you want to have for uh, development. First of all, you should log all the queries because it makes it much easier to find out what you're doing with the database. You should also do it in production, but I know that uh, most people don't. <coughs> Sorry. Um, then you should use MariaDB SQL error log, which logs the query that generated an error. You should enable user statistics and performance schema. And then those system tables uh, are also used by some informational views that you can find in the GitHub examples and add in useful information for um, for the developers. For example, one of the views that you can find <coughs> in uh, the GitHub repository um, contains all the queries that never returned um, any rows and therefore are probably useless. Um, then you should probably also add some tools from Percona Toolkit, if nothing else, at least PD Duplicate Key Checker. Uh, which should be used after adding indexes to check if those indexes are duplicates. Let's talk Vagrant files. So, uh, most Vagrant files uh, start with these two lines. Um, I don't consider it super important personally, but it's uh, it's considered a good practice by the Vagrant uh, and possibly Ruby community. It simply says to VI and Emacs that the Ruby syntax is used. So um, this is the structure of a Vagrant file, a bit incomplete, but again, it's the structure. <coughs> As you can see, First of all, it's a Ruby file, right? So first recommendation is learn some Ruby if you don't know it. Uh, I'm not an expert. I, I'm not saying you should be, but knowing Ruby allows you to do some magic. For example, you can read configuration files or you can take decisions based on the environment. As you can see, the first line uh, defines a variable. It takes it from, um, uh, from the command line. So um, basically, in the command line, we can change uh, this variable to change the uh, behavior of the vagrant file. The second line requires a minimum version for vagrant. This is very important actually because um, over time you probably upgrade your vagrant, 
but if the developers don't, uh, you may reach a situation when you change a vagrant file, it works for you, but it will not work for developers. So mm, they should use ideally <laughs> the same version you use. Then mm, you can see some nice Ruby syntax, which basically says we are going to do something with vagrant.configure. Uh, two means we are using version two of the API. And then we um, decide which Vagrant box we are using, which means which system we are going to use. Then we have uh, providers. Um, you can specify one or more. Uh, here we specify VirtualBox and then VMware. It's very important because you know, maybe you are switching from VMware to VirtualBox, but you don't want the switch to be a trauma. So um, you ask some developers to install VirtualBox. Um, if VirtualBox is available, it will be used. If it is not available, VMware will be used. And in the meanwhile, um, developers who made the switch can report you problems and the Vagrant file will still work for uh, all other developers. And then we use uh, a provisioner. Actually, we can use uh, any number of provisioners, zero or more. So um, let's consider the first uh, provider we're using, VirtualBox. As you can see, we are um, configuring it. It's not mandatory, but we can do it, and it's a good practice. The first line basically uh, defines a name for the machine. It's useful because if you use a VirtualBox a graphical interface, you can see the name of the machine instead of seeing uh, uh, random names. Um, then we decide how many megas of memory uh, it should use. We decide that um, we must be able to add or remove CPUs, virtual CPUs, while the machine is working. You can see the comments that we can use for that. Then we decide a maximum of CPUs, and then we assign four megas of uh, video RAM, which is more than enough, honestly, because um, by default, no graphical interface is used. So let's talk about provisioners. Um, you can see two examples, actually, right? Uh, in the first example, we use um, the shell provisioner, meaning that we are going to run um, a shell file called bootstrap.sh. And then you can see the Ansible provisioner, uh, where basically we are using um, a playbook called mariadb.yml. Um, both are used in the GitHub um, repository, except that in the repository Ansible is commented because um, it could be installed on your machine or not. I don't know. Um, but my recommendation is use Ansible or Puppet or Chef or uh, Salt. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I mean, choose the one that you use in production. Uh, this has several advantages. For example, when you are um, developing something, I mean, you are um, modifying, uh, for example, a playbook, you can reapply it incrementally and you don't need to uh, recreate the machine every time you change something. Um, it's important for developers because they also don't want to um, recreate the machine every time uh, you make a change. Uh, of course, they could because the development machine is not supposed to um, contain um, data that is hard to rebuild, but, well, sometimes it takes time. And also, uh, the most important thing is 
If you use, for example, Ansible in production and then Ansible in development, <coughs> you can make some changes uh, in production, for example, adding some tasks. And then if you want to have the same tasks in development, uh, you can use two very modern features called copy and paste. Um, OK, then the last thing is uh, uploading files to the VM. So for example, we have um, configuration files, or maybe we have a dump of the database with the database structure, and we want to upload these files to the development machines. Well, um, there is actually a special provisioner called file, but I don't suggest to use it because it works by uploading the files via SSH. And the SSH user, um, by default, does, doesn't have permissions to um, write anything anywhere except for uh, the synced folder. And honestly, this shouldn't change. So if you care about uh, security and also simplicity, I suggest to um, have the files you need inside the project directory or a subdirectory, like in this case. <clears throat> and then you can move the files elsewhere um, oh, because um, I assume, I'm assuming you know that a synced folder is a directory that is visible from the uh, host system and also from the um, guest system. And then uh, it can be moved uh, elsewhere in the guest system via shell or Ansible, like in this case, or anything else. OK, so um, a very brief summary of things that hopefully we learned. Start with a single machine. Use more only if you have to. Prefer virtual machines over containers in most cases, but again, it depends what you use in production. Um, be careful to set MariaDB variables uh, that affect queries. They should have the same values in development and in production. Use um, variables in the vagrant file so you can avoid having multiple versions of the same vagrant file. Uh, use vagrant.require version to force developers to use um, a version that supports uh, everything you are doing. Um, learn some Ruby because it will be useful when you do uh, more complex stuff. Um, configure the provisioner you use, meaning at least set hardware resources. Again, it depends. Uh, every provisioner has different options. And uh, finally, use automation tools like um, Ansible or Puppet or Salt or um, Chef. Use the same tool that you use in production. If you don't use uh, one of these tools in production, probably you should. So thank you for attending. You can see again the URL of the GitHub repository containing a working example. I really suggest to take a look at it because I described um, good practices, but in the repository, you will find more details and more practices I didn't have the time to describe here. So thank you a lot for attending.